This is Streptococcus pyogenes, a pathogen that is responsible for a whole host of human diseases, from strep throat to scarlet fever and necrotizing fasciitis, which is also known as the flesh-eating disease. Now, despite its general nastiness, this is also a very fascinating bacteria. When you take a closer look at it, you see that it has these extremely long and thin hair-like appendages. These are called pili, and they're important virulence factors. The bacteria use them like hands to feel around and recognize different surfaces, recruit other bacteria, and initiate an infection. These hairs are made from a single repeating protein unit that is linked together, a bit like links in a chain. When you zoom into the atomic structure of a protein, it looks a bit like a string that's folded into a ball. This string is made from building blocks called amino acids. Now, here's the interesting thing: the proteins that make the hair-like appendages on Streptococcus pyogenes and other similar bacteria, they contain a very special chemistry that's not really found in other places in nature. These proteins are not a linear string, but rather a circular string. The ends of the proteins are linked together by a spontaneously forming chemical bond called an isopeptide bond. Basically. The ends react with themselves to form a very strong lock. This makes the proteins as strong as stones; they become indestructible. You can boil them, try to cut them with enzymes, or throw them in strong acids and bases. Nothing happens to them. In fact, these are some of the strongest proteins that have ever been discovered. Now, the reason why I'm giving you this quick primer about this specific bacterium is that. It was the subject of my doctoral research at Oxford. When researching those strong chemical bonds, together with my advisor Mark Howarth, we engineered these special proteins to make a new kind of molecular superglue. Think of it as a superglue that you can buy at the store. You know, the one that if you stick your fingers together, it's impossible to unstick them. Our glue creates this kind of a strong bond, except at the molecular level. Protein to protein. Something like this didn't exist before. It enables a variety of applications, such as engineering new medicines, developing vaccines, making biomaterials, building tools at the nanometer scale, and much more. So, how do you make glue from a stone-strong protein? As I mentioned, a protein is like a string, and these super-strong proteins, the ends are linked together by an isopeptide bond. To make a circle, to make a glue, I needed to break the circular protein into two molecules that could first specifically recognize each other and no other proteins, and then have the ability to form a new chemical link with each other. My working theory was that if I split the proteins in such a way as to separate the building blocks that made the isopeptide bond, then those blocks would maintain the capability of recognizing each other and linking together. Even if they were originally part of separate strings. <laughs> Now, making things more difficult, of course, was the fact that proteins have evolved over many millions of years to form very specific structures, <laughs> and they don't really like you when you mess with those structures. If you try to change them, they start misbehaving and doing strange things. So, after carefully studying the atomic structure, I identified regions of the string that would be least disruptive to break, and I started to break the protein into two molecules. And make a small library of different versions. Then, I took the two parts and I simply mixed them together. And indeed, as I'd hoped for, the two components, without any help, were able to recognize each other in solution, refold into the original protein structure, and glue together by forming a highly specific and irreversible isopeptide bond. Now, from this library, some versions didn't work. Some worked a bit, and some worked really well, forming a very strong bond, one that once forms never comes apart. What I had was a new kind of glue that could be used to assemble proteins and enzymes, for instance. So, on that basis, I started to engineer the two components, try to find the best possible versions, and make a small and fast glue 
that pretty much worked in any situation. I call the two components spy tag and spy catcher. So, how do they glue things together? Putting it simply, the split strings aren't just able to recognize each other and only each other, by forming unique and special links that allows them to fold together into a ball. But they're also able to lock again and form an immovable bond. And when they lock, they staple together anything that's attached to them. You can program the two components into the actual genes of any two proteins. Then you make the proteins. And as soon as the glue components see each other, they spontaneously react and form an irreversible bond, bonding the proteins themselves together. This happens in test tubes, on the outside of living cells, and inside living cells. In other words, having engineered and formalized these components allows us to build new protein shapes as easy as playing with Legos. But, and you know there's always going to be a but, you're not just limited to proteins. You can chemically link the glue components to other organic and inorganic molecules, like medicines, DNA, metals, and much more, to build nanoscale objects that can address important scientific and medical needs. And you can also have a bit of fun along the way. It's kind of like playing nanoscale Lego. So, of course, the enormous benefit of having a protein glue that lets you build new and interesting shapes is that proteins are biology's workhorses. They're very diverse and are pretty much responsible for everything the cell does, from the way the cell is organized, its shape, how it interacts with the outside world, and so on. That makes them fundamental to the scientific and medical industries. For instance, I mentioned earlier that a circular bond makes a protein incredibly strong. So, if you program the glue components at the ends of an enzyme to circularize it, you can make that enzyme resistant to boiling temperatures. Or another example: you can program proteins to spontaneously assemble into a three-dimensional scaffold that can serve as a framework for holding cells together, for tissue engineering. Or you can program bacteria to produce biomaterials that contain the glue components. So they can glue various active parts to create materials that not only exist but are able to actively do things, like a paint that contains enzymes to produce new chemicals. Or you can use a superglue for developing vaccines. Instead of simply presenting the immune system with a foreign substance to initiate an immune response, you can break the foreign substance into smaller parts and glue them onto a scaffold, kind of like decorating a Christmas tree. Then. By presenting the decorated scaffold to the immune system, which becomes exposed to many different parts of the foreign substance all at the same time, you can initiate a stronger immune response and have a potentially better vaccine. Or you can rapidly assemble new antibody shapes in many different ways. Antibodies are an important part of the body's natural defense system against disease, and they're also changing the way we treat disease. And having ways of finding better antibodies can help us make better medicines. With this glue. Antibodies can be broken into smaller parts and reassembled in new combinations to speed up the process of finding new medicines. Now, there's a personal side to this story. A decade ago, when I was starting my studies at Oxford, my intention was to develop a new generation of antibodies for treating cancer. <laughs> Instead, I ended up making glue from the flesh-eating bacteria. A glue that makes building new biostructures as easy as playing with Legos. You imagine a new shape, then you simply build it with proteins. I didn't get the chance to directly work on developing a new generation of antibodies for treating cancer, as I wanted to when I first set out. But I did make a glue that many others have used indirectly for trying to find new antibodies for treating cancer, and many other innovations that could one day help improve people's lives. And I guess that epitomizes science. Frustrating, amazing, and filled with possibilities, all at the same time. Thank you.